Oh, we have an amazing treat for you this morning. This young lady that's about to come up, this young lady that's coming up here as we speak. I just want to, I just, what? Could not be. <laughs> I just want to, uh, last night, at just a little bit before midnight, we were sitting around our island talking and, and, and I said, Melinda, tell me a little bit about like where you live, the living conditions and all. Do you live in like a regular house there? I mean, she's from Africa, Tanzania. Yeah, so we're not ready for her yet. I, but <laughs> I want to talk about her a little bit first, right in front of her, not behind her back. She said, well, yeah, no, we live in a, a hut with a grass roof. It's like, oh my goodness. I said, so what, what, what is it like? She said, well, we kind of live out of three huts. We have a, 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 a cooking hut, and we have a sleeping hut, and we have a bathroom hut. It's like, oh my goodness. So this lady is someone that sacrifices incredibly, lives through all kinds of hardships to do what God has put on her heart and called her to do. And it's like, oh my goodness. Renee said, I am never gonna ever complain about anything ever again. <laughs> after Melinda was just sharing with us a little bit. But she wasn't complaining. She was just saying what it's like, what they do, the sacrifices that they make to bring the word of the Lord and to do what needs to be done to, to take care of more of God's people. So I'm gonna... I was just um, thinking Wednesday, it was so incredible because everything that was happening in the world, I mean, all the stuff about Afghanistan, I, my heart was so heavy, and when Melinda started praying, I just felt something break off of me because she had such bold prayers and strategic prayers. And Melinda, that courage that you have, I mean, she has been, well, you're going to probably hear some of the stories, but I'm telling you, there's something about somebody that has passion for people and compassion to go out and save the lost. And I, I mean, it really has put something in my heart. And I was telling Lynn, I, I am thanking God for everything. And I, I think it's our church, we, we are thankful people, but literally I'm thankful for electricity. I'm thankful for hair dryer, for water, for a hot and cold water. I'm thanking you, Lord, for toilets. I'm thanking you, God. This girl has to get up out of it and go to a different place to go to the bathroom outside where there's snakes and everything. I'm like, Lord, I just, I just bless you, Melinda, that it's going to be so much better when you go back home. Amen. So, it, everything's going to improve in her Amen. world. And we just thank you for the anointing on your life. We thank you for laying down your life to be on the mission field. Amen. And so... Bless you. I'll just say one, one more thing. When, when someone has made that kind of commitment and lived like this for 30 years, no, 35 years, it's like God gives them a special power. When she was praying over Renee and I in the prayer room, it's like, oh my word, this lady carries authority and incredible power, power of God manifest and, and working through her. So just get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's give a valley welcome to Melinda. Hallelujah. 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 Maybe before she gets started, we could all, as we're standing, just extend our hands towards her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just come to you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the anointing that is going to flow. We thank you for the freedom in the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would give her exactly what you have. I felt yes. like there was fresh manna yes. coming from heaven today. Amen. I could almost smell it. It was yes. like fresh manna from heaven. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Have your way, God, in Jesus' name. In yes. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus. And Lord, give me the boldness to speak boldly and accurately the oracles of God. Lord, I pray that each and every person goes away changed. They'll never be the same. And everybody gets what they need. Holy Spirit, you speak to them. Make it alive and make it fresh in their hearts that they get revelation from heaven today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
I love these people. Do you know what a gift of God that you have with your pastors? You have a very precious gift. You know, Jesus, it says in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, that when Jesus rose, that he gave gifts unto men. And one of the gifts he gave were pastors. So you need to receive your pastors as a gift from God to you. And I'll just say in this church, it's one of the most beautiful churches I have ever been in. And uh, I just want to say to the, the founding fathers who have, and mothers who have been so amazing in creating an atmosphere of love and that these folks walk in it, it's not even just the fact that the church itself is beautiful, the people are beautiful. And I'm just blessed to be here. Uh, I like seeing beautiful things. I live in a place that's maybe not so beautiful. I'll just have to say. Uh, everything has its beauty. And uh, I'm thankful to the Lord for the calling that he gave me when I was seven. And seeing these youth up here stirs me. I was born again and spirit-filled at 13. And... Uh, began to walk in my call. The Lord reminded me of my call when I was 21 and uh, went to Bible school, finished my university studies, went to Bible school, and then uh, went on the mission field at 27 as a single woman. Um, and that's what I'm going to preach a little bit about today. I went to Congo, the Belgian Congo, which was Zaire at the time. There were no telephones. It took me six months to get a letter from my parents um, none of this instant stuff that we have today. I mean, now, I talk to my husband, who is in Zambia right now, um, every day, twice a day. We can talk. We can look and video each other, you know. It, it's amazing. I say some of this uh, electronic stuff is a gift from God, because, for missionaries, because we wouldn't have had it otherwise. Um, be able to communicate. I, I think of the old-time missionaries that went to Africa and, and China and India and had to take a boat. I get to fly on an airplane. I'm spoiled, you know. So um, it does take some time to get back and forth, but I thank the Lord that we are at the season we're at and that we have been called, you and me, at this hour, at this time, we are brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And the young people are here for such a time as this. God's called them and he wants to use them. But don't think because you're old that God doesn't want to use you. He sent Moses at 80. There's no one left out. God uses all the generations. Hallelujah. And you can make your decision. If you're young or if you're old, my best days are before me. My best days are before me. Hallelujah. Well, let's turn to Psalm 68, verse 20. Um, like I said, I was in the middle of Congo and I was really struggling uh, with so many things. So there's no 911, there's no ambulance, there's no help in the natural in any way. And uh, while... <laughs>
is to us a God of deliverance says. Did you catch that? It's in the plural. Our God is to us a God of deliverance says. And salvation. And to God, the Lord belongs escape from death, setting us free. And I, I mean, it just spoke to my heart. I said, oh, dear God, that's for me. He's got enough deliverance for today, for tomorrow, for our future, for what Deliverance is there. He is a God of deliverances and salvation. Now, I've been praying this over the, the nation of Afghanistan and over our beloved brothers and sisters. Because it says that the, to the Lord belongs the way of escape from death, setting us free. And I said, Lord, you give them uh, the, the way to escape death, setting them free. I know some, the Bible talks about it in Hebrews chapter 11, that will give their lives. It says that they didn't escape, but they gave their lives so they might have a better resurrection. But those that, that uh, God says, I will spare you. And I've got, some, I've got some stories to tell you. We were in Rwanda. And the, the young people won't know about Rwanda, but the older people should remember in 1994. Now, my husband, I was seven months pregnant with baby number two. And uh, I started complaining to my husband, we've got to go to Nairobi. I haven't even had seven months. Imagine, lady, seven months, and I hadn't even had one doctor's appointment. Yeah. We lived in the middle of nowhere in uh, Bukavu, Zaire, uh, Congo. And so I'm like, we have to go. We went, I actually preached, seven months pregnant, at a church in Kigali, Rwanda. We got the last plane out Tuesday night. Tuesday night, and Wednesday morning, I believe it was April 7th, they shot down President Habirimana's plane. And it was the first time two heads of state had died at the same time because the president of Burundi was with him. And we barely made it out in time. And then we couldn't go back to Congo, so we had to live in, in Kenya for six months, where I had my baby. And during that time, I had such a burden for the, our friends and our people in Rwanda. And I get up and pray in the middle of the night, dear God, rescue them, rescue them. And I am telling you, our God of deliverances rescued them. One... Jean-Claude was the most amazing testimony. And I've been praying this for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Uh, Jean-Claude, very strongly Tusi. Now, if you understand uh, the Tusi people, there, there's the Tusis that are tall. They're actually Ethiopian. Very smooth-skinned people, high cheekbones, thin noses. They look different from normal Africans. Okay, So they're very distinct. And on the bottom of their hands, their hands are black inside instead of white which the Bantu tribes are different than that. So the Ethiopians are very distinct from the Bantu. And um, so that was the, the Hutus killing the Tutsis. So in this, Jean-Claude's very distinctively Tutsi. And they came in to his house where he was staying with guns, and they said, what tribe are you? He said, I'm not from a tribe from around here because he's saying inside, I belong to my heavenly tribe. So I don't belong here. I'm from heaven. So he said, I belong to another tribe. And they said, let's see your hands. Let's see. No, you're Tutsi. We know you're Tutsi. And uh, they put the gun straight to his head, and he's praying in his heart. He says, Lord, He said, Lord, you delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. You will deliver me. They shot point blank at his head. And it didn't work. They threw the gun down and they said, I'm going to kill you. And they grabbed him by the neck and tried to strangle him. And he's praying and said, Lord, you delivered Daniel. In the lion's den, you'll deliver me. And it was like a bolt of lightning struck that man on the head who was trying to kill him. And he jumped back, and the whole group turned and ran away. 
he was spared. Hallelujah. God is to us a God of deliverances and salvation. Now let's go to Psalms 91. This is the key. I want to give you the key. I want to break a spirit of fear off the people of God. Because right now in the world, they are trying to control the church and everyone by a spirit of fear. And we should not be moved by fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. All right? So we, it, it, fear, it's a spirit. It's a spirit. He says God has not given us a spirit of fear. There's a spirit involved. So we have to, how do we deal with this? I love, uh, I just read a book this last year by a man named Blake Healy. Do you guys know Blake Healy? He was uh, from Bethel, Reading, and he's now running the School of Supernatural Ministry in Atlanta. And uh, he has a gift of seeing in the spirit. And the one thing he said is, you know, you could do a lot less rebuking of the devil if you change the atmosphere. See, what you're thinking on, what you're speaking, either allows the demons to come in or it keeps them out. Hallelujah. Okay, so it says here, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, there's a key factor here. I'm struggling with fear. I'm, I'm in a place where there is no 911. There is no ambulance. There's no hospital. There's nothing I can rely on except for God. And the Lord spoke this to me. He said, if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow. You know, he used these two words, dwell and abide. That means it's the place that you spend the most of your time. That's where you get to that private time. And you know, all the rest of the promises hinge on the first two verses. And people, you know, you wanna, you're having a problem, you want to run and, and start declaring Psalms 91, but I'll tell you what, if you haven't been spending time in the private place, that secret place of God, it's going to be a lot harder to work for you. It's like, you know, if the, if the thief comes to your house and that thief is big, and you're like, Margaret, where are the barbells? That guy is big. I need to start building. You're late. You understand? You're late. You got to build yourself in, in, in today, <laughs> in the early time. Don't wait until it's a crisis. Don't wait until you have terrible symptoms before you're spending time confessing and meditating on your healing scriptures. I'm giving you the secret of victory. There was a terrible tornado in El Reno, Oklahoma. The pastor's wife there said, I don't know how come we couldn't break it. And what the Lord had shown me was, he told me this before. He said, some of the things you won't be able to, to change because you waited too late. <laughs> you know, if you live in Tornado Alley, you'd better be confessing that tornadoes have no power <laughs> around you. <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, we lived in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania for almost 20 years. And uh, there were thieves, Muslims trying to kill us all the time. I had my car rushed three times trying to pull me and the children out to kill us. Okay? It was, they were marking houses. It wasn't uh, uh, an unusual thing. The 700 Club, they were always talking about the persecuted church in Tanzania. We lived in the middle of it. I know what it's like to live in a persecuted church. They, they would throw stones, you know, throw dust at us and curse us. It, it's, it's a normal thing. We lost several pastors. They burned down in 2012, eight churches. And then they said on Easter, we're coming to get all the church pastors and churches in Dar es Salaam. We're going to kill you all. Now, would you go to church on Easter if you knew they were coming to kill you? We did. We called our children and told them goodbye in case we didn't come home. And we said, we're going. Even though the American embassy said, don't go. 
American Embassy is not my boss. God is. And we went ahead and went. Now, I'll give you a little background on this. Two or three months at the time, the president was a Muslim. And uh, so he wasn't going to help us at all. Uh, a group of pastors came and they said, President, would you, you need to stop this. They're planning to murder us. And he said, if your God is the real God, let him protect you. Yeah, that's what he said. Do you understand? That's a poke in my God's eye. He's trying. And we prayed, and I'll say this about the church of Tanzania. When you live in persecution all the time, you are on your knees. You don't mess around. You know that any day you could be the target of an attack. So you got to hear from God. You got to walk with God. You got to keep yourself sharp all the time. So we were on our knees praying all the time, making our declarations. I would stomp around our church and say, it's not coming here. It's not coming here. We have authority. You know, they didn't kill Jesus until it was his time. They didn't kill Paul until it was his time. They didn't kill Peter until his Now, all of them died a martyr's death. And I've told the Lord when I was 16, I said, Lord, you died for me. I'm willing to die for you. I want to die for you at a martyr's death but not until it's time. When it's time, then I'll be happy to lay my life down for the Lord because he did that for us. But we don't let Satan have not even an inch, not even a millimeter. We use our authority. When God shows you it's time, then you say it's time. And Peter, Jesus, Paul, they all knew before it was time, they knew when it was. Because Peter says, God has shown me that my end has come. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, he says, my time has come. Both of them. Jesus said the same thing. My hour is here. He kept saying before, it's not my hour. It's not my hour yet. But then he knew when it was. Now, I'm just going to give you a little thing. Um, you know, we quote a lot Revelation 12, verse 11. We overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But I don't hear everybody confessing and they love not their lives unto death. Because that's part of it as well. That means you have nothing else. You are 100% for God. And you have nothing else, no idols, nothing else in your way. You got to put your kids on the altar. You got to put your husbands and wives on the altar. You've got to put everything, your house, Everything, your cars, nothing else can hold your heart like Jesus does. That's when you get boldness. That's when you become fearless. Hallelujah. So what happened? I haven't finished my verse yet, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the story since I already started. 2013, Easter Sunday. Okay, go back one or two days on... Um, was Saturday or Sunday? It was either Good Friday or Saturday. I don't remember which day. All of a sudden, a 16-story building downtown across from the biggest mosque collapsed. And the Muslim youth that had been trained in Somalia for murder, they had um, sent... 600, 800 youth to Somalia to train them how to be terrorists. And, uh, yeah, they were the ones coming to, to do the job. Guess what? They were too busy burying their dead. Never happened. They didn't attack. I said, you know what? I have authority. I can pray that not one church leader is destroyed. I'm not going to allow any of our brothers and sisters. And so... In prayer, we prayed, we made our confession, we believed God, and we went boldly. And not one, not one was touched. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's God. It was God who did it. He did it all. Hallelujah. So, it takes dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. And the second part of this is very crucial as well. It says, I will say of the Lord, he 
is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I trust. I will say of the Lord. See, the words coming out of your mouth are huge. It makes a difference. It paves your future. Don't be saying foolish things. I don't like to let anything come out of my mouth that is not true, that is not edifying. I don't use bad words. Some people think it's okay to cuss as a Christian. It is not. You know, if you let bad words come out of your mouth, you, you're being used of Satan <laughs> to be cursing things. You don't say those sort of things. You don't let, don't even say negative things about other people. Now, let me just say this. If there's anybody going around speaking negatively about your pastors behind their back, slandering, this won't work for you. Because honor is everything. You have to honor your leadership. Hallelujah. If you want to cut your prayers, bad mouth your pastors, bad mouth your wife, and it'll cut your prayers. That's what the Bible says. So, stop. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Because I, I want us to go over the top, every one of us, to be victorious in our lives. And God has a plan. It's a good plan. It's for a future and a hope. He wants to use you. You know, we shouldn't have any empty seats in this place. If everyone even just brought one person, would the church not be full? If you get one person saved, could you not get one person saved this whole year? Everyone. You have a responsibility to tell somebody else. I am extremely bold. My child, I've got three kids, but my children roll their eyes because mom witnesses to everybody. And it's okay. I am not doing it for them. I'm doing it for the kingdom of God. So if I go pump gas, there's somebody there, I'm going to talk to them. If I'm in a line, even at Starbucks, I, I'm not, I don't care. I'll talk to them. You understand? Because I care about the souls of people. There's nothing else you can put in heaven but the souls of people. That's the most important thing. That's the riches. I want to be rich in heaven because I have my tables at the banquet of the bride. I want my tables full of Africans and Indians and Chinese and Filipinos and all the people groups that we minister to in Africa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fill your table up. Bring someone. At least, I mean, just do one or two, even a year. If you did that much and everyone keeps doing that, how much? This whole place will be too small. It will. And that's what God wants us to do. This is the season. This is the hour. And the anointing is there. Love people. Love them. Don't be snotty and mean and rude. I, it's kind of amazing I have to tell people that. But I've seen people that are mean. You don't go up and tell someone, well, you're just going to hell. I mean, does that love them? <laughs> Do you remember what uh, David Wilkerson did for Nikki Cruz? Nikki Cruz pulled out his, his knife, and he's like, I'm going to cut you up into a million pieces. And, and what did David say? He said, and every piece will say, I love you. I love you. And that's what won his heart. That's what broke his heart for God. Loving people. It's all about loving them to Jesus. Even if they treat you bad. Even if they're nasty. As believers, we should be the most loving, kind people in the world. And that what the Bible says is that they will know us by our love. Okay. So, I'm not getting very far in the scriptures. But... Uh, but God is the God of deliverances. And all the deliverances hinge on those two verses. Spending time in the secret place and being bold in your confession. you got to be bold. Which means you have to put the word of God in to have it come out. Okay? So on the good days, every day, how much time do you spend reading the word? Now, I'm going to give you another testimony. So 
um, my first year in Africa, and I didn't have a car for my first two years, I would walk to Bible school to teach, and that, it was about uh, two miles. So I would take two or three verses, and I'd just meditate on them while I was walking. I'd say, oh, Lord, you know, uh, 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Greater. The greater one lives inside me. This is how you meditate. You chew it over and over and over. It's like a, a, a cow chewing its cud, you know. Uh, the greater one lives inside me. And you meditate on every part of it. Okay? The other, my other favorite verse as a missionary, maybe it doesn't mean anything to you, but it sure means something to me. And that is Luke 10, 19. I tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by enemies hurt me. That's my favorite one right there. So I would meditate on those two verses as I'm walking, because you know, don't, you don't know where the snakes are and the whatever, you know. So, and, and snakes in Africa, they're like all poisonous, kind of. Not totally, but pretty much. Uh, I had a 30-foot python living across the street from my hut. A 30-foot python. Ate everybody's dogs and cats. Yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> anyways, it's gone now, in Jesus' name. Never to return. Anyway, I would walk. I would walk, and, and I would make my confession. I'd be meditating on the Word of God. And um, the next year, in uh, January of 86, I was overlooking the Bible school by myself, and uh, everyone else was gone. And I had gone out to Lake Tanganyika. And Lake Tanganyika is like the fifth largest lake in the world, and it's the number one deepest lake in the world. And so it, it actually laps up like, a, like an ocean almost, you know. So I got my Bible. I, I had so much stress and pressure from doing the Bible school, and I was just learning to speak in Swahili and trying to preach it. My classes in Swahili, it was just a lot of, a lot of stress. And I was like, okay, Lord, um, I'm just going to have time with you. So I go over there, but I didn't realize where I, where I went was right next to a Congolese uh, soldier camp. And Congolese soldiers, they're kind of bad guys, all right? They're not disciplined. They're just bad guys. And so I'm sitting there with my Bible on my lap. I had my eyes closed, and I was just praying and worshiping God. And I open my eyes, and I'm surrounded by 20 Congolese soldiers, and they're reaching for me. And I was like, okay, their intentions are not good. But the first thing out of my mouth was, you can't touch me in Jesus' name because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You know, fear could try to grip you. you I, there's no way I could have fought them off. But the first thing out of my mouth was the thing I was meditating on. And I guarantee you, the first thing out of your mouth when you have a, a, a trial coming to you, when, and the trials come to everybody. Guys, they come to everybody. All right? Don't think just because you're a Christian, difficult times aren't coming. They come to all of us. But we have to be ready for it. And here I've been meditating on that verse, and when they came to grab me, the first thing out of my mouth was the word of God. And they went, oh, and they all just turned around and walked away. Hallelujah. Now, that was God. That was God. Hallelujah. He is faithful. But our job is to stay in that secret place. Our job is to have the word of God coming out of our mouth, to be bold, to, to rebuke that spirit of fear by putting the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It says that we have to meditate on the word day and night. What are you meditating on? If you're meditating on CNN, I'll tell you, you are going to have trouble, great tribulation, fear, because there's nothing good there. But if you put in the word first, I had to basically stop listening to all news because it's like, this is not good. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to the word, and it tells me what to do. It gives us, it's fresher than any newspaper. Hallelujah. It says he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence, COVID, cancer. 
He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noonday. And a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near me. Can you say that? Hallelujah. It shall not come near you. Yes. Hallelujah. God is faithful. He is faithful. When we were in Bukavu, Congo, and they had uh, what they called the pillage, which is French for pillaging, and uh, Mobutu did not pay the Congolese army at all for months. And so the people were desperate. So he said, okay, over this weekend, you can just go pillage, break into people's houses, take everything you want. And they started. And it was like, wow, um, lots of people lost everything they owned. Some people were shot. And, you know, I was praying, Lord, what do we do? You know, I was literally shaking people. We, we didn't have communication, so we had CBs that we would talk, missionaries would talk to each other. And they were screaming, the commandos are coming, the commandos are I was physically shaking like this. And um, my husband said, let's sit down and let's pray. Don't listen to anybody else. Just let's sit down and let's pray. God, what do we do? He said, don't go. Everyone else ran, but we didn't leave. Because God said not to. He said... I'll spare the city for your sake. This is what he told us. I'll spare the city for your sake. So you stay. So we stayed. And God gave me Psalms, it was it Psalms what, 20, 27, which says, even if an army comes against me, even if they all come against me, in this I will be uh, at peace. And I know my God protects me. So we didn't go. We were yamachoma. We were roasting weenies. And everybody else was having a terrible time. And our city was the only city that was spared in the whole nation. Now see, if God said to go, we would have gone. But you have to hear from God. That's what it's all about. And if you stay in that secret place, and you're constantly putting the word of God in there, and you say, I hear the voice of my shepherd, the voice of a stranger I will not follow. That's my confession. I don't want to make a wrong move. It could cost my life. You know, when we went to Rwanda, and I'm going to tell off of myself, when we, we were traveling there to fly when I was seven months pregnant uh, to go to Nairobi, and I had felt in my heart we should fly. And, and we were driving, and my husband's like, no, we don't want to spend that much money. Let's just drive. I was like, yeah, I should have insisted. I had a beautiful Land Cruiser that was purchased for me from Kenneth Copeland in 1988. And we drove to Kigali. Within four days, that car was stolen when they started the war. I lost a $40,000 car because I didn't listen to God. And I was complaining to God about it. God, my car was stolen. I'm really upset about it. And he said, in a very stern voice to me. And the next time you disobey me, it'll cost you your life. I kind of went, <gasps> whoa, okay. I repent, I repent, I repent. It was my fault. I didn't listen to you. I didn't obey. Okay. Sometimes it's very crucial to obey God. It'll cost you when you disobey. And he warned me. I felt it all day long. I should have just insisted. I learned you know, because sometimes the husband hears from God, sometimes it's the wife. You've got to help each other. You know, if one feels it real strong, then you listen to that one. No, I know it's this way. It's like, okay, hallelujah. God will rescue us, but we have to put him first and listen. It says, because, look at verse 9, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Now, if I lived in America, I would take this psalm 
and I would walk around my house and outside around the parameter of my house, and I would read it. And I would say, COVID doesn't come to my dwelling. That's what I would do. Because that's what I did in Africa. Okay. So I made my declaration. I, I'll, I'll stop with this one story because it was an amazing story. Uh, <laughs> we, had, we had a break-in in, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And uh, they came over the fence and they stole a bunch of stuff out of the yard. And it made me really mad. And I came back and I looked at the word and I saw all these verses, how much God hates stealing. He hates it. And I hate it. You know, I was like, no. So I was really upset by it. And uh, I began to pray. And this is why it's so important to watch every word that comes out of your mouth. You don't say something nasty and rude. Guys, speak nicely to your wives. Ladies, Speak nicely to your husbands, okay? Don't let bad words come out of your mouth of putting anybody down, mocking them, or saying bad things. Let every word that comes out of your mouth be a word of God. And then you make your tongue arsenal against the enemy, okay? You make your tongue a weapon. He said that the word of God is the sword. So if we're speaking, you know, James said it this way, you can't have bracken water, salt water, and fresh water coming out of the same well. You have to make sure you choose which water you want coming out. It's got to be water of life. Water with salt kills things. Water of fresh water will bring life. Okay. So this is what I did. I made a declaration and I walked around with the word of God, and I put a, a bloodline all around the wall. We had 12-foot walls. It's not like we didn't have walls. We had 12-foot walls, but there was one side that only had four or five feet. And that's where the thieves were coming over. So I just walked around it. I made a declaration. No, you can't steal from us anymore. And I put a, I put a bloodline of Jesus' blood around our property. And I, I read Psalms 121. I read Psalms 91. And I made a declaration. And I put the blood of Jesus around it. And I said, in Jesus' name, if anybody comes over this wall again, Lord, you have your angels with flaming swords, and they will hit them. Yeah, I said that. They will hit them. And then, when uh, four days later, I wake up at four in the morning, and I see my door open for the laundry. And they came in and they took my soap. That soap, laundry soap, in Tanzania it costs $40 a box. So you better believe I'm not ready to let that be taken. You know, I was mad and I was very disturbed. But I didn't take my faith off. I want you to hear this. Even though it looked like with my eyes that this didn't work, I'm looking at it and I'm going, no. I put my word out there. I put God's word on it. And I believe that what I say comes to pass because I don't let any words come out of my mouth that don't belong to Jesus. I speak his word. And so, Lord, I believe, I believe that if they took anything, I recover all. And I'm, I'm staying strong from 4 o'clock to 6. At 6 o'clock, somebody's banging, banging, banging on the gate. And they're shouting, and I'm like, What's going on? What's the matter? So Dan and Caleb go outside, and, and Dan said, Oh, well, that's the neighbor. And the neighbor said that the thief came through at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he was screaming, and he jumped out of his shoes, and he left all of our stuff at the, at the fence, and uh, we, we found his knife. He had a knife for protection so he could stab us if we stopped him. Uh, but he left his knife, he left his shoes, he jumped, literally jumped out of his shoes, running away. And I said, it was the angel of the Lord. It was the angel of the Lord. I recovered all, down to the little scoop. When I couldn't find the scoop inside my laundry, so I said, okay, God, I need my scoop. I want my scoop. And I guess what? They found it right at the fence. I got it all back. Plus, I 
got the booty, I got his shoes, and I got his knife. And I would cut the tomatoes with that knife and just go, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. They never came back. I tell you, they never came back. Hallelujah. So I just want us to stand. I want to stand. I just want to pray for a spirit of boldness, that spirit of authority to know who you are in Christ and what Jesus has given to you. I want you to move in that. Lord, Lord, you, you put that holy boldness in these people. Let them never forget this, Lord, and the things that have to be adjusted in our hearts. You know what it is. You know where we've allowed Satan to try to steal from us. We say no more. We say no more. No. Because, Lord God, you are our God. And we hide in the secret place with you. And we let the words out of our mouth only be your words. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, I bless these, your people. I surround them with a wall of fire and your glory within. Lord, I rebuke every bit of spirit of fear. It shall not come near their dwelling place. It shall not come near their homes, their, the, 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 the temple of God. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, I just pray for strength. And Lord, as we are standing here, because we know that our prayers make a difference, we are going to lift up our voice and we're going to pray. As they prayed for Afghanistan, we're going to pray for it right now. And I'm going to give them the strategies, every single one. You know, this is your opportunity to pray because every person that we prayed for in Rwanda was supernaturally delivered. We can pray for the church of Afghanistan and they will be delivered. So Lord, right now, we bind a spirit of fear against our Afghani brothers and sisters. And we declare that they are bold for you. That signs, wonders, and miracles happen. That when the Taliban comes, even trying to mark their houses, their eyes are blinded. They can't find them. Lord, we declare that you give them strategies and ways of escape. We declare, Lord God, that a spirit of death is bound off of them. The spirit of death is bound. They can't even kill them. Like Jean-Claude, they can't kill them. Because, Lord God, you are greater. You are life. You are life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, we also pray for the greatest revival this world has ever seen. And, Lord, we declare it happens to the Taliban in Jesus' name. We declare it happens to them. We declare, Lord God, there cannot be any rape or destruction against the children, the women. In Jesus' name, like you protected me from the Congolese soldiers, you will protect them. That they won't violate the temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord. You protect them. We lift up a wall. We lift up a standard around them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you for supernatural deliverance. The ones that are to be rescued out, may they be rescued. The ones that are to be bold and stay in and witness and, and, and win the lost, even the Taliban, they'll stay and they'll, they'll, they'll be delivered. They won't be able to harm them or kill them and not a hair on their head will perish. We pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And all the people said... Amen. Amen. Just saying, um, I don't have a whole lot of these, but I have some. You can sign up for our updates. Uh, it's, it, it, we let you know what to pray for while we're out there. And uh, just give us an email address. It doesn't cost anything. So we can send it out for free. And we just covet your prayers. I, I have to say, the reason we're still alive is because of this church praying for us. Absolutely. It's your prayers that have, have really helped us survive in some of the darkest times. Because we all need each other. We all need each other. Uh, there's no man, there's, I, I could say I go out there and I'm fine all by myself. I am not. I need your prayers. 
Okay. So if you, if you want, not everybody maybe wants to, but you, I've got a paper. You can sign it. Put your email on it. You'll get an update every Wednesday that just says, this is what's happening. We call it Adventures with Dan and Melinda because our life is never boring. Three, four weeks ago, my husband drove through a herd of elephants, got charged. I'm telling you, life is never boring. Anyways, we love you. We bless you. I'll uh, turn this over to Pastor Lynn.